Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Wednesday night Zoom with AJA. My name is Tanil Murray. I'm the Community Engagement Director at AJA. Tonight, we have the privilege of welcoming our guest and very close friend to the Australian Jewish Association, Mark Leach, who we had the privilege of working very closely with in the Never Again Is Now rally, which I'm sure a lot of you attended, was incredibly successful. Mark is also an Anglican pastor, and tonight we're discussing the fight against anti-Semitism. We're discussing what threats we have against the Jewish community, the Christian community, including Islamic extremism, radical left-wing activism. And we are so privileged that Mark will share his personal story of confronting anti-Semitism. So please, could you give a warm welcome in the chat to Mark Leach? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tanil, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, David and Robert. It's just a great pleasure to be here uh, with you. And um, uh, well, except I always feel like it's a real tragedy that I have to be, because if the world were a better place, uh, I wouldn't be running around doing the things I'm running around. But we find ourselves in these dark days confronting great challenges. So that's why I'm here. Uh, what I plan to do <clears throat> is uh, just give you an outline of a bit of my background, a bit of where where we've got to, what, what, what I'm working on now, and then um, a little bit of a uh, overview of what I see as driving the current anti-Semitism, and that will inform our strategy going forward long term. And uh, I should be able to do all of that in 20 minutes, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. Uh, and I'll, I'll be very, I'll be delighted to take those questions. So my own background, uh, I grew up in Africa. My mother was a German Jew who with her parents fled uh, Frankfurt in Germany in 1938 after watching the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany in the 30s. My grandfather was a doctor in um a practice with a Gentile. He'd fought for the Germans in the First World War, was decorated, uh, a very loyal, patriotic German who could not believe that uh, he would end up getting persecuted, that this would happen to him. And so through the 1930s, my grandmother was saying, we've got to go, we've got to go, we've got to go. And eventually, um, just before Kristallnacht, they got out uh, and ended up as refugees in a little town, a little country called Swaziland, a British protectorate that uh, was still taking the, the British, you know, put the last few Jews that they got out in there. So I grew up, and they were German Jews, secular, reform, uh, but I grew up in the in the shadow of the Shoah, like so many of you, I'm sure, where that uh, that hung over me and our family is the reality of uh, of pogroms, of persecution, of being refugees, of always having to flee, being ready to flee. And uh, my mother, my, my family weren't a religious. My mother late in life married my father, who was a Roman Catholic, white South African, and uh, notionally Roman, notionally Catholic. I think apart from the wedding, the next time he went to church was at his funeral. So uh, um, quite irreligious. He was also a mercenary, fought up in the Congo, and other parts of Africa, and then he smuggled emeralds and diamonds and was generally uh, not a particularly helpful individual when it came to uh, parenting and fatherhood and so on. So I grew up in a in, the, in Africa in the context of uh, lots of violence, lots of, uh, lots of challenges in all kinds of ways. Uh, and then as a teenager, I had a, had a deep experience of God myself, which caused me to become a follower of Jesus. And I've spent the last 30 years I started studying medicine, uh, following in my mum and my grandfather's footsteps, and then decided I would be a physician of the soul rather than the body. Uh, as, as wonderful as medical doctors are, I thought I, I really wanted to help people connect with God, who had made such a profound impact on my life. So I've spent the last 30 years leading Anglican churches, I came to Australia to study, lead churches. And, and what I've always said to people is I'm just a Jew following another Jew, and uh, I've tried to help Gentile or non-Jewish Christians understand the Jewish roots of their faith and to try and be a bit of a bridge between the two communities uh, to the extent that I could. Now, obviously, all that changed for me on October the 9th, October the 7th, like you all, I watched the events unfolding in Israel uh, almost live on Twitter, uh, was, was horrified at what was happening. 
Um, and then on the Monday, the 9th, I uh, heard that there was going to be a pro-Palestinian rally in a town hall uh, at the steps of the cathedral. And um, oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, uh, my brother, my older brother had become a, uh, a Muslim. And so I understood, I understand Islam from the inside. So I'm a, I'm a walking bundle of intersectionality, bringing the major faiths together and uh uh, and, and so on the ninth, I heard there was going to be this rally, and I thought um, that's just you know the the blood hadn't yet dried on the ground of southern Israel. They were still chasing terrorists around, um, and and I thought, how can they possibly have a uh, this rally in the city center while they're simultaneously telling the Jewish community to stay out of Sydney. So I phoned the police. I said, should I go? I, I said, I want to go and wave a flag. I want to at least protest and say, this is this is unacceptable, you know, two days after the greatest massacre of Jewish people since the Holocaust. So the police said to me, no, if you come down, we will arrest you because uh, as a to prevent you breaching the peace and for your own safety. And I said, oh, well. Um, or words to that effect once I hung up. And I went down anyway in my clerical shirt and I stood on the steps of the cathedral in Town Hall Square and I watched them um, getting riled up uh, and the, the kind of horrendous, just the spirit of hate, which was so real. Um, I heard a bunch of young guys shouting, kill the Jews. At that point, I thought, uh, I can't just sit and watch this, stand and watch this anymore. So I pulled an Israeli flag out of my bag and I waved an Israeli flag and um, and a bunch of them then got a little riled up. And I mean, they were very, very angry and aggressive and um, chased me out of the square, sort of threatening to slit my throat. And I ran up Bathurst Street and George Street and then hid behind a police van and they dispersed the mob. Um, and then obviously that group then later went down to the opera house. And my intention had been to try and show show Australia. I figured I'd get a bit of media attention if I did that. And, and I ended up getting a lot, but I wanted to, I wanted Australia to see what was actually happening and that it was unacceptable. The chants like from the river to the sea uh, are actually calls for the ethnic cleansing of Israel. And uh, that it's just so full of hate and it's so un-Australian. And I thought as an Australian citizen, as a pastor and uh, as a Jew, uh, I had to, I had to stand up and say, this is, this is just, this can't happen. We can't just all look the other way and let this happen. Um, and so fast forward a few uh, few weeks, it, things things escalated, they got worse. Um, I connected then, I, I started thinking, well, hang on, we, we really need to actually mobilize the Christian community. This isn't just a Jewish problem. This is actually fundamentally a problem for our whole society. If we tolerate this kind of hatred at the core of our cities and our society, um, and let it go unchecked. That's a major problem for all of us. So um, I connected with, uh, through David Lewis, who's a wonderful, he's the president of the Great Synagogue here in Sydney. He'd connected with some beautiful Christian leaders in the UK who ran a, an organization called Christian Action Against Anti-Semitism. They'd run a big event, uh, sort of a solidarity rally outside number 10 Downing Street in London. David had been at that. He'd asked, he'd said to them, we've got to do this in Sydney. Through a series of relationships, I connected with David. And uh, just before Christmas, there were four of us sitting around going, okay, we're going to do something in Sydney and it's going to be central Sydney and it's going to be huge. And we're going to send a message to Australia that we're standing with the Jewish people against this hate. And uh, it's it was an extraordinary journey from there to uh, the 18th of February, February where we ended up with 12,000 people in the domain um, Scott Morris and the former prime minister, a whole bunch of speakers, and just an amazing experience of working together, the the Jewish community, the Christian community, some of my atheist, secular, libertarian friends, the Iranians, people just came out and worked together. And uh, it was just fantastic um, and a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Um and we we started this thing never again is now it's become a national movement um we we had 130 volunteers on whatsapp helping us out helping us organize it um and uh it was really quite powerful and for me the um the thing that made it all worthwhile was on this was on the sunday night after it had happened one of the one of my new friends in the community who leads a, one of the community organizations called me and he said mark i 
I just want you to know um, what this was like for the community. And I, I, he said, it was like on Sunday afternoon, you stretched out your arms and you gave 12,000 people a hug. And we all felt love for the first time in months, uh, if not years in Sydney. And I thought that's, it's exactly what we're, we're trying to do. And I thought it was all, uh, it was all worth it. And um, it, it was amazing. So our goal was to mobilize and our goal is to mobilize the Christian community and this broader secular Australian community to stand against anti-Semitism and to stand with the Jewish community. Uh, and so that the Jewish community feel loved and not alone. Um, so my family in their experience of the 1930s in Germany, like so many, you know, so many of the secular of, of the Christian Germans just kept their heads down, looked the other way, hoped someone else would solve the problem. The pastors encouraged their congregations to sing louder. And, and obviously there were, there were for sure some spectacularly courageous Germans who stood up against uh, the Nazis and uh, people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who in the end lost their lives. Um, but they were in the minority. And it's become very clear to me that we are in terrifyingly similar conditions to 1930s Germany. And I'll, I'll speak about that in a moment. And, and it's, it's incredibly important that it, that this is seen the anti-Semitism and, and what this is doing in Australia is seen not as a Jewish problem. This is actually fundamentally a civilizational and a cultural problem for all of us. And so while it affects for sure, the Jewish community at this instance, more than it affects everybody else, it is it is absolutely for sure um, a problem for all of us that we have to address, and and it's urgent now. Now we should have been addressing this very aggressively forty years ago, but uh, the best time to have started this was forty years ago. The next best time is right now. So uh, it's right now, all in, and we we've got we've got big events planned for Melbourne, for Brisbane, for Perth. We did an event in Adelaide that was smaller and was met with a very aggressive uh, Palestinian, pro-Palestinian response um, and, and was very ugly. So there's conflict, I think, out of Sydney. Two things happened. Uh, everyone who supports this went, wow, this can actually work. You know, you can get feet on the street in large numbers and create, and, and that's very, very significant. But then I think the... Uh, those who are on the other side of this conflict also realized, hey, this is something we can't let go unopposed. So I'm, we are fully expecting that this will continue to, we will get increasing opposition. Um, but that's okay, because the difference between what we've been trying to do and what they're trying to do is stark. We show up with Australian flags. We show up saying we love Australia. We love this culture. We love each other. We want to be inclusive and cohesive. And they show up hating Australia, hating our culture, uh, waving Palestinian flags and full of hatred. So uh, I, I really believe as a as a pastor, as a Christian, uh, and as someone who's, who stands in, in the Jewish tradition, that love will triumph. So I'm I'm an optimist. I think we'll have dark days and battles ahead, but I think I think the battle will be won by love and by light in the end. But it takes good people to stand up and uh, get involved. So. Um, uh, in another context, of, I, I think this fight for our civilization, I think God, God will, God's purposes will triumph for sure. You read that, you look at the last three and a half thousand years of Jewish history and you go, okay, I think we're doing okay. God will, God will protect the Jewish people, his chosen people for sure. But it's like you've, you're standing there with a shovel, resting on your shovel while you're asking God to dig a hole. I, I think you got to, you got to dig as well. You've got to work with God. So um, that's it. So I see, uh, I see all these hands. Now, what should I do with the hands, David? No, do we... Nothing, nothing. We manage that. Okay, you manage the hands. I just feel rude. I see you all waving it. I'll, I'll just wave back and say, I see your hands, everyone. I'm not ignoring you. Um, so <laughs> I, I see the the battle uh, on two fronts, um, and. Uh, and the way I say it is, we we have a we have a battle against radical Islam, jihadist Islam. I wrote an article that went in the telly and on Twitter when called "When the Caliphate Comes to Town," and uh, for a couple of decades now, I've been extremely concerned, really since nine eleven, about resurgent jihadist Islam and their strategy 
to expand the caliphate around the world. Um, and I've been very, very concerned about the naivety of us in the Western world because we we don't understand the deeply religious roots of this movement. So we when they say they want to establish a global caliphate and that they will kill Jewish people and infidels, so you've got, you know, you've you've got a couple of choices. You you either convert to Islam, you live under submission to Islam, or they kill you. We 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 think, oh well, that's just religious talk and it can't possibly be true, you know. Um, but actually, for the last 1,400 years, we know that that there is a segment of the Muslim community for whom that is actually true. They they really, as a, as a deeply held religious belief, are holders to be true. Now, thank God, the vast majority, you know, maybe 80% of the Muslim community, like my brother, for example, did not believe that jihad was a, a violent physical war. It was a spiritual war. Um, but there is a battle to understand the religious roots of Islam, to not be shut down and shouted down by the uh, the elites or the establishment who call it Islamophobia. Um, you know, it's calling a rational understanding of the religious nature of radical Islam, Islamophobia, and uh, something we don't have to worry about, is like discovering a cancerous tumor and then just saying, oh, it's just a benign lump. Don't worry about it. Don't go to the doctor. Don't get it diagnosed. You're just being alarmist if you think you've got to go and get this operated on. And I go, no, 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 it's not, it's not alarmist. It's just, we've got to see it for what it is. The response to radical Islam, uh, in my view, has to be religious in the first instance, because because it's a religion it's not a it's not just a political ideology and the religious response has to be twofold uh, we in the judeo christian tradition i believe firmly have to lean much more deeply into our own religious traditions and communities and be very grounded and very confident in in what we believe um so i think and I say this with all respect, I don't know where you all are on the religious spectrum at all. Uh, but I would say this is this is really you need you need deep religious, you need a, you need a sense of God at work in all of this and your confidence in your own identity and your own spiritual life and your community and your tradition. So that's the Jewish side. As a Christian, I'll tell you what I think the best strategy against Islam is. That is massive, prayerful, incredibly well-funded proselytizing of the Muslim world. Okay, so uh, I was thinking about this. Like uh, the best thing, yeah, you know, Jackie Lambie at the um, at the uh, rally in Sydney said the only good terrorist a dead terrorist. Like I disagree. I actually don't think that's right. The only good Islamic terrorist, or the best Islamic terrorist is one who gets converted to Christianity and becomes a follower of the Jew Jesus and then turns others to Jesus because, you know, that's what's happened with uh, uh, Mossab, uh, uh, the Green Prince. Um, I just forget his surname now. Um, that's So if, if you ask me as a Christian pastor, I'm like, what's the answer? Well, the answer is is strong military force, being aware of it. But then that's what I pray for. And that's, you know... I'm sure many of you think I'm completely nuts. This is the other way I think about it. I know in, in Judaism, as a Jew, we're not a proselytizing group. We, we we do our best just trying to keep Jewish people religious and engaged with God. Um, think about Christianity as the proselytizing wing of Judaism. So the Christians are the ones who take, and this is what Maimonides said, right? Christians are the ones who take the Jewish monotheism and Jewish worldview and values to the rest of the world. And that's what we need. So that's that's just a thought. Um, uh, and I, I don't know what you make of it, and I'm happy to take questions about it, and you might think it's nuts. Um, I don't think this can be one just militarily, um, though I think obviously a military response is important because uh, jihadist Islam respond to strength. They don't. Appeasing terrorists never works. So I'm a Christian pastor but I'm also deeply committed to a just war theory and to the need for a nation state to defend its people. So there's that. 
I think the other problem we've got, so on the one hand, we've got radical Islam. On the other hand, this is all made so much more difficult because of the um, radical left that we are living in and the power of the radical left now and the kind of the hed hegemonic control they have of the media, of the elites, of so many of our institutions. They control our universities. And, and what we've seen since October the 7th is how uh how the how polarized our society is and having been cut off from our judeo-christian roots and values and this aggressive move really intellectually for 200 years but particularly post second world war this move away from god in our culture has and there's there's having become disconnected from our traditions and our culture, you are now left with an atomized society that is turning in on itself. And the left, the radical left hates Western civilization. They hate Orthodox Judaism. They hate Orthodox Christianity. They hate the authority of God. They want to be free. And the craziness is in there, they've also then read, uh, you know, Franz Fanon, and they've bought into this oppressor, oppressed narrative. Uh, and, and in some crazy, bizarre twist that I, I have a whole hour long lecture that we could go into, the left have now aligned themselves with radical Islam in a orgy of, of Jew hatred. Now that's a line that'll play well on social media. That just came to me. I think it's a, but it is that, and it's, it's Jew hatred because somehow the Jew and Israel is like a anti-sacrament of the West and of God and of civilization and of, of everything that's good and true and beautiful and pure. And there's just this, so, so we've got this coalition of, of evil uh, and it hates the truth and it hates love and it hates life. And so we've got a battle on our hands to go back to the roots of our culture, to renew our culture, to renew confidence in our traditions, in our communities, in the scriptures that have informed us. So, the, our culture, it's not a Christian or a Jewish culture, but it's a culture that has um, its deep intellectual and spiritual roots in the Hebrew scriptures and in the way the New Testament then unpacks and develops the Tanakh. So um, I think we've got a spiritual and an intellectual and a moral challenge ahead of us, the magnitude of which we should not underestimate. Um, this is this has been this has been. 60, 80 years in the making, uh, and and even longer. It's been 1,400 years in the making in Islam, and uh, we have become rich, complacent, divided, secular, naive, good intention. The you know, if we're just nice to people, they'll be nice to us. And the problem, of course, with that is that. That, uh, as Blaise Pascal said, every human person is both the glory and the garbage of the universe. Like we're we're and, and the scriptures teach us this. You and I, everyone on this call, and every Muslim and every Nazi, we're glorious, amazing beings. The image of God is never lost in us, but that image of God and our capacity for free will also is relentlessly turned towards evil. And that's true. That capacity is true in all of us. So we have. Um, we have a battle, uh, and and I will finish with this because I've been waffling on for twenty five minutes, and I can see we need to take questions. Um, uh, I would say the answer before we before we go to war with people out there, actually, the real battle is in our own hearts and in our own minds, our own connection with God. Uh, I think I think we have to avoid two things. Well, the proverb, book of Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart because from it everything else flows. So, so we as we as Jews and as followers of the Jew Jesus, uh, we need to guard our hearts against, particularly in this moment, uh, hatred and fear. Um, we, we shouldn't hate. Uh, no one, we should not hate anyone. We can hate what they've done for sure, and I do. But I've had to work so hard to guard my heart against hate. Uh, and somehow, you know, you you can even go to war and kill the enemy without having a heart full of hate. Now, now that's another whole talk. 
and another whole thing to think about. But we also need to guard our hearts against fear um, because we should not be afraid. There's a lot to make us afraid, but you just have to read our scriptures, read the Psalms. You go, yeah, what is the, what is what what do the scriptures tell us? Don't don't trust in chariots and horses. <laughs> trust in God. Uh, you know, like don't trust in F-35s. I mean, praise God for them and their technology. Don't, don't. In the end, uh, God is God and there's hope. And he has preserved the Jewish people as his people for three and a half thousand years. And I have absolute confidence that, that he will continue to do so. Now we will suffer, and Christians will suffer, and uh, but I think uh, God will God will triumph, uh, and love will win, and light will win. So don't give in to hate, and don't give in to fear. Guard your heart, and then let's mobilize and let's move. So that's the thing we've got to do, right? We've had the strategy of just be quiet, work with the politicians, keep everyone happy. Like that is that has not worked. So what we're doing with Never Again is now, and what I'm excited about is we're going to do all the political advocacy, the media work, all that stuff, but we have to get feet on the street. We have to get tens of thousands out in all our cities saying we as Australians stand with the Jewish people. We stand on the side of truth, and we will not let radical Islam and radical left destroy our country and destroy our civilization. So it's a... Uh, and, and someone said to me the other day, well, Mark, but what if... You know, maybe it's, you know, there's 2 billion Muslims and we're lost. Our culture's lost. And I'm like, yeah, it, I'm only responsible for my actions. I can't control the outcomes. And and even if we lose, I am going down swinging for our culture, man. I'm not giving in on my watch to the extent that it's up to me. I'm not going to let 1930s Germany happen again in our civilization and in our country. So um, that's what Never Again is now is doing. That's what I'm doing. and. Um, uh, that's it. Uh, I will now pause at 8.28 and take questions. And gosh, there's a lot on there. Oof. Thank you, Mark. That was very inspirational. So thank you for that. And uh, we've seen in the questions a lot of people wanting to take part. Well, a lot of people that have taken part in the rallies and a lot of yeah. people wanting to. So we'll put any details we have of any events in the chat. And also, if anyone subscribed to AJ emails, we'll make sure to keep you yeah. updated about any events as they're announced. Um, I think you're... Your idea of a proselytizing the Muslims. It's very interesting. Good luck with that. Um certainly does seem to calm them down a bit. Um so I don't know. That's that's what, um so we're gonna go to questions. I, saw, I actually saw a great article from an Orthodox Jew in New York arguing for the massive evangelization of Gaza. He said that's it. the real hope for Gaza, the reconstruction, is you just flooded with American evangelicals, man. Just uh, you know. Um yeah. I mean, no, people bring no, no. Bibles into North Korea. So, I mean, if that's yeah, yeah. It. Well, once, 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 Hamas have been defeated and we've got to reconstruct it. You just rebuild it as a Christian enclave. I mean, how cool would that be? Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Um, all right, we're going to go to questions in a minute, and we'll just remind everyone: put your hand up to ask a question. You'll keep a very brief one question a person, no statements. We might skip some people to go to new people. But before we do that, David's just going to provide a quick update about next week. Thank you, uh, Robert, and uh, thank you, Mark. Um, as we do each week at the end of the event, uh, make sure you're an active supporter of AJA. This doesn't happen by itself and all the advocacy and community work that we're involved in um, needs support. Uh, go to the website, jewishassociation.org.au. Make sure that you've signed up to the email list. Um, please consider making a donation and uh, make sure you're following us on social media for very frequent updates. Next week, um, we have uh, Yoram Hazoni. Uh, wow. He had a, uh, a family crisis when we had him booked previously. So talking about the uh, virtues of nationalism and conservatism, two values um, we hold dear. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to throw a question at you, Mark, uh, unscheduled. But um, you tried to make the Never Again Is Now rally in Sydney uh, as broad-based as possible. 
but there were no serving Labor members of Parliament. There were ex member of Parliament. Mm. Was was that intentional, or did you just struggle to get uh, any Labor parliamentarian prepared to stand up? Uh, before I answer that, I'll give a plug for Yoram Hazoni. If he, if get on next week, get your friends on this call. He is brilliant and an incredibly important voice in this. Uh, his book, uh, Rediscovering Discovering Conservatism. His book on uh, scripture is the, the philosophy of Hebrew scripture. His views on nationalism and community have been very influential to me. So I'd give massive plug for him. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, well done, David, for, for getting him. That's brilliant. Robert. Uh, okay, so um, your question was labor. To be honest, uh, we invited Chris Minns. We, we, want this, we wanted it to be a bipartisan event. Uh, and we had we dis, we invited a number of uh, labor people, but for a whole bunch of reasons, it was difficult for them to attend. I think they were adopting a wait and watch and see approach to this mm. um, in Melbourne. And it's also re- some of it's relational. So in Melbourne, um, some of the key people I'm working with are very strongly connected to the Labor Party. And I think it's going to be easier to get them along. So we are, we 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 want to have a bipartisan approach. Uh, if you're politically inclined, I would always say I think it's critical for us all to join a party. And I think pick one of the two major parties. I'm not a fan of the minor parties. I pick a major party. If you if you're lay if you if you're inclined more to the sort of you know intelligent left join the labor labor right i think keeping the labor party supportive of the jewish community and supportive of israel is critically important so um i have encouraged uh, and and the the pro israel group in the labor party uh are are under a lot of pressure and they're a small group and and they're not as as influential as they once were so uh we, no we want to work across both parties that's the answer but the conservative side of politics currently in australia is certainly far more supportive of our message and of the Jewish community and of Israel. We we also take a similar approach. I mean, we work with all parties, yep. except the Greens. Um, there's vanishingly few people in Labour uh, worth working with, but wherever there are, we do still uh, at AJA um, yep. work with them on, on common goals. So just the one question, um, which we've had from a few written ones. So you're taking this grassroots initiative, but a lot of people have been quite critical of the Christian churches. I mean, there's your own church, the Anglican church, there's the Catholic church, if, if you don't want to go into your own church. But what what do you think of the response of the um, organized churches towards anti-Semitism, October 7, Israel, and all that? Uh, in what may prove to be a ecclesiastically career-limiting move, let me say it has been appallingly inadequate. Uh, but it is par for the course. The church, tra- tragically, uh, the church is not immune from anti-Semitism or from apathy. So uh, there is a we have a fine history, really, since Augustine in 389, of institutionalizing uh, the marginalization and forced conversion and oppression of Jewish people. So uh, the church has a long history of that, and it is a it is a shameful, shameful history. Um, uh, I, I mean, you all. Know, I'm sure you all know the history. Uh, I mean, one of the great things in the Crusades. Uh, I was talking to a friend who's a historian. You know, during the Crusades, there are these documents from Jews who are living in Israel, in the land at the time, and uh, they preferred the Crusaders over the Muslim invaders because at least the Crusaders didn't rape the women. They killed you. They burnt down your synagogues, but they didn't rape the women. So uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. So I would say. Uh, it has been extremely hard. The hardest thing I've had to do is endless conversations with Christian leaders about this and to get them to say, um, yeah, it's it's been it's been hard, but we can't give in. And and what what actually helps um is uh, we have all these beautiful Jewish people in our teams who are now calling churches. And let me tell you, when you get an Israeli on the phone talking to a pastor about Israel and inviting them to come along uh, with, you know, that, that has some weight. So uh, one of the things we're doing is looking at putting together teams of Jewish folk 
like a who want a Jewish folk who wants to go with a with a non with a Gentile Christian to go to churches. And we want if we can get the resources together, we'll coordinate this, train people up. So most Christians in Australia don't know any Jewish people, and they they think it's all a problem in the Middle East. They watch the ABC, so they get worried about the IDF. They think it's a it's a terrible thing. And and what we want to do is just say, hey, you know what? Jewish people are, are being persecuted here in this country. And you guys should stand up and do something about it, irrespective of the Middle East. So we're, we're trying to think about creative ways to address it. Um, the Anglican Archbishop was the only denominational leader, Anglican Archbishop of Sydney, the only denominational leader who put out a statement against anti-Semitism. And he did that because he stood in his office window and he watched me being chased outside his cathedral. And I've known him for 30 years and we're friends. And he went, yeah, this is really a problem and we can't, you know, but it didn't get a lot of media and they've been very quiet. They're all worried about dividing their churches. They're worried about putting off the Muslims in the, in the areas where they have churches and so on. So it, it's a problem and it's disappointing. And um, it is what it is. And we're trying to push back as much as we can. Yeah, I have heard the Sydney um, Anglican uh, diocese is, is quite is better than some of the other ones. So hopefully yeah. that's all your work. So that's good. All right, let's go to Helen first. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask you whether your intentions are to also tackle the legal system in Australia in this matter. Um, up to date, I do believe it's against the law to incite to violence, and the reaction of the police has been to send the uh, victims of the incitement home mm. in order to stop any commotion. Uh, yeah. You know, probably know what I'm referring to when they were yelling, burn the Jews, and the yeah. reaction was send the Jews home and mm. not arrest the people who were inciting to violence. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thank you so much, Helen. Um, we're very, very concerned about the uh, this response of the police. Now, I understand it. Uh, uh, and let me say the police in New South Wales, we worked closely with the assistant commissioner and his team for the event we held in the domain. They were fantastic. Um, but they've had 20 years of training to essentially appease the Muslim street because what they don't want to do, they've, they, they don't, they don't want, violence on the streets and so it's easier to move on that easier to move the jew than to move the the mob right so i just think that's wrong so we have to address that um and we have a few ideas but it's going to take a broad you see what has to happen is you've got to get twelve thousand jews and christians on the street and then then they have to face it then then it's an issue right when it's one or two or five or ten counter protesters it's very easy just move them on and everyone ignores it and keeps going so there's a there's a public pressure thing uh the other thing that we need to work on is to get the come some of the key slogans like uh we we've we're trying to figure out getting the phrase from the river to the sea uh if you you want to get that classified as hate speech and then enforced i think that would be good the other thing we're thinking of, we've had legal advice and, and David and the and you guys and AJA, you're across all of this as well. And we want to work together. But one of the key things is uh, instead of going after free speech, you go after sedition. So we need stronger sedition laws. So when a sheikh in Lakemba calls for Sharia law and the overthrow of the government and that the only really legitimate government is a Muslim government, that's actually a call for the overthrow of the Australian government. That's sedition. Now, at the moment, that's not. As I understand it, the laws are not strong enough to allow prosecution. But the advice I've had, or the, the thoughts I've had in conversations with lawyers, is actually that is a very helpful way to go after closing down genuinely seditious speech without limiting free speech. So I'm a massive fan of free speech. Like I don't mind. People can. Like, I'm I'm not quite a free speech absolutist, but I'm. But I really think free speech is one of the things that makes our country great. So I we don't want to limit that. But we also don't want two-tier policing. We want the police to police without fear or favor, and we want rules that are, that are anti-sedition. So um, there's a lot to work on, and lots of us are working on those various things and in various community ways. I know AJA, ECADG, all the Jewish peak bodies are working on these sorts of things as well. 
And how can be, I can see a few people in the chat want to volunteer or help out. Let's see the convergers volunteer in different cities. Um, so how can people get in touch ah. with you? Is there a website or a group? Or uh, yeah, so um, you go to the website neveragainisnow.com.au. There are links to express your interest to be um, uh, to register for the various events. And we're, on the website, you can also offer to help out. Uh, we want to build a grassroots movement of many, many, many thousands of people who over the next five years push back the hate and uh, and work Jew and Gentile together. I mean, that's the, for me personally, um, it's a bringing together of my two identities. I feel like I'm like this literal physical bridge between the two and there's wonderful joy and power in bringing those two groups together. So, uh, to, so sign on up and, uh, uh, and, and join us um, a, a, in that way. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I just, sorry, I'm on the chat and I see Joseph Goldbaum saying that I've heard this a lot, you know, the police had no trouble being incredibly aggressive during the lockdowns um, uh, for, you know, like just insane. I mean, the, 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 the rigor of their policing versus what we see now. So we have to, we have to work with the police ministers and the governments to go, you can't give, you can't cede your streets to the mob. You cannot, you know, you can't do that. So uh, we're, yeah. Yeah. I think everyone remembers uh, the police, like this cracking skulls and arresting pregnant women and, Everything yeah. uh, let's go to Hugh. Hello, Mark. Um, I'm a Christian based in the UK. And actually, yesterday I was on, I re recorded a program on Revelation TV, uh, which is a Christian TV, uh, TV station based here in London. And I was on with Tim Gutman, who, yeah. with his wife, Hayley, co-founder, of Christian action against anti-Semitism. Um, my question is, do you, do you think internationally we can work better together? Oh, hundred percent. So we were actually on a Zoom call. We had Tim and, yeah, absolutely. With working with Tim and Haley, um, we're, we're gonna use some of their training materials for uh, the groups are gonna guard into the churches. Um, I'm in conversations with a couple of U.S. groups uh, who are wanting to mobilize Christians in this way. Um, yeah, I think those of us, particularly in the Anglo sphere, need to work together. Uh, absolutely, uh, it's a it's a massive problem. It's a big problem in the U.K. Or this is massive in the U.S. Um, so we have to work together. And I would say one of the major challenges we have is a demographic challenge uh, that that the support for israel drops off dramatically when you get to people under 40 uh, and support for conservative causes tradition religion drops off across all segments of society so we have to reach the the folk who are in their 20s and 30s and we've got to work incredibly hard now otherwise in 40 years time there will be no political support for israel or the jewish community in our democracies unless we push back the radical left because the, the the young people are seduced by the Greens and the, the radical environmental movement, the radical leftist movement, um, and then they're drawn to to hate our civilization and actually then to hate the Jews and hate Israel. So we, we have, a, we have a, a big challenge. And yeah, we mm. should work internationally. Very keen. That's a great question. Thanks, yeah. Hugh. Um, it, can you still hear me? I can, but I'm not sure we're going to take supplementaries because there's a, and get into a discussion as well, much as I'd like to. I just want to say that, that um, the National Jewish Association, which is similar to AJA here in, uh, in Britain, they're having a Zoom debate about whether uh, there is any future for the Jewish community here in the UK. And that's how bad things have got. Yep. Yeah, I mean, thanks you for that. It's very concerning. We have very close ties with the NJA, um, a similar role to AJA in the in the UK. So these these problems are here too. Um, yeah. Anna Berger, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the rally. I was there. It was very inspiring. We actually met there. Um, just a couple of things. When uh, Muhammad cursed the Jews, he also enjoined his followers 
to kill all the Jews, all the uh, the uh, non-believing Christians as well. And you've got to mention that because it's yep. everybody else. Yeah, and they're not, you know, they don't realize that it's also them, the infidels. Um, but mm. the other thing with all of that is, I've had a hobby horse, and that is to say, let's stop talking about anti-Semitism, let's call it for what it is, which is anti-Jewish racism, mm. because the left, the hard left, has no problem with anti-Semitism, but they don't like racism. So we have to use the language that they use. Mm. And that's racism, because that's what it is. Anyway. Yeah, beautiful. I, I think uh, language is being twisted and distorted and redefined at a great rate in our culture for political purposes. We see this in a number of fields of debate. Gender is one of them. And this is another one. Genocide has taken on a new meaning. Obviously, you know, genocide is now uh, when you kill a bunch of your enemies in a just war of self-defense that you didn't want, you didn't start, but you have to win. Uh, and it's now genocide if, you're, if your favored group are losing because, you know, their strategy is to actually have most of their, women, their, their, innocent, their civilians massacred in a public opinion war. So that's now genocide. Uh, and I think anti-Semitism is the same thing. So now, obviously, I'm, you, you all know this. People now distinguish, oh, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Zionist. Yeah, yeah. Anti-Zionism is just the new Jew hatred, right? Like it's, uh, yeah, so I, I I like calling it Jew hatred, but it's very, that's very strong and very polemical. And I'm, uh, my wife tells me I should use a more, a gentler term, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, yeah, we've we've got a language. You know, the language is redefined everywhere, so we do need to think about that for sure. Um, and I should just mention you. You mentioned some of the problems uh, with the youth generation. Uh, we had uh, your daughter Frey actually was yeah. a guest speaker a few weeks ago. So for anyone who hasn't made the connection yet, and she's a bit of a ray of hope for the youth. So <laughs> if anyone hasn't seen that uh, YouTube, it's it's on the AJA YouTube channel, and I would recommend yeah. that. Yeah, she's pretty special. I'm, she's like a mother. <laughs> um, all right next up we've got hazel would you like to ask you a question oh sorry hazel you need to unmute again yeah. okay yep good now i i don't know if anybody watched andrew bolt this evening um where he spoke yet again about another mullah a palestinian refugee now preaching hatred and saying the most horrendous things about jews in his um sermon um i won't go into what happened there but because my question is um muslims keep saying they're a religion of peace so maybe this is a hopelessly naive and optimistic question but in all your dealings with religious leaders have you had any dealings with anyone from the muslim community and has anyone expressed any kind of sympathy or concern or uh, interest or anything in what is going on and saying this is not what we represent i personally have not um and i think that is because i have i am just flat out with what i'm doing in the jewish and christian communities uh, and probably a bit like many of you here, I still, it still feels a bit raw to uh, to reach out uh, at the moment, but I know people are. So there are many Muslims of goodwill and most of them now, as I understand it, are too scared to speak out in the current environment because because that is a very scary thing for them to do. So what we have to do is when all of this has calmed down, as it will, when Israel's won, when Hamas is destroyed, when when peace has come again, God willing, yeah, that's right, we have to engage. Uh, so my, but I, I, so that is when, when I think about my work and my vocation, I think for Never Again is now, uh, we need to engage Muslims who actually value Judeo-Christian civilization and want to build a healthy country here. Now, I don't know how that's going to happen right now, um, but we can't give in to fear and we can't give in to hatred. Um, both those things are you know, 
scarily close to the surface for a lot of us at the moment. Uh, so I, I, I think it's coming. Yeah. But I would say, lastly, the Muslim community has been staggeringly silent, by and large, in its uh, you know, speaking out. And this has been every Jewish, like anyone I, or the rabbis I speak to have been involved in interfaith work. I mean, it's 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 tragic. It's just tragic. Yeah. David, you had a, a screen up. Yeah, I just I just showed very quickly a picture of uh, Imam Tawidi. Uh, who has made it his mission to try to uh, be a bridge, uh, extended a hand of friendship to the Jewish community, and he has suffered greatly yeah. uh, for for it. Um, he's been bashed a number of times. He's now no longer living in Australia. I mean, we're still in touch occasionally, um, and... Uh, um, but he's he's doing some good work overseas still. Yeah, yeah. And we we do have a few individual Muslims um, who've reached out to AJ and who we work with. Mm. Unfortunately, the Muslim leadership in Australia has been terrible. I think everyone's seen probably the Islamic Council of Victoria keeps saying crazy talk. So the leadership is it's an issue. Um, I wanted you to, to ask you to elaborate on one of the points you mentioned. Um, the rally in Adelaide. Um, we saw some unfortunate scenes, and we know it was dealt with. Uh, in the news can, can you talk us through what happened there yeah so we the uh details that the, the adelaide rally was smaller it's a smaller community the location and timing of the rally was leaked to the pro-palestinian side we think from one of the media so we had a press release out to give them notice of where it would be and when and we think one of them leaked it to the pro-Palestinian side. So they got themselves organized. Uh, we knew this was coming. So we had long conversations with the police and they assured us that they would keep the pro-Palestinian counter protest uh, at a reasonable distance away and stop them yelling and shouting down the event. We made it clear to the police that we are um, that our event was more like a church service, more like a worship service. There were speeches and prayers and music, and we weren't a protest or a rally. We're just, you know, a bunch of everyday Australian Christians along with their Jewish friends meeting. So um, what happened then was the pro-Palestinian group got there very early and set up right near where the where where our group was going to be. Uh, the police were there in large numbers. They had they had mounted police, um, but they uh, the officer on the ground refused to authorize his police to move the group back or to stop them from yelling and hurling abuse at these beautiful old folk. It was an elderly group, like you know, I mean, horrendous. So the police had assured us one thing on the day on the ground, they simply formed a line and kept them apart. So uh, they had whistles and they kept yelling, hurling abuse for two hours at, at our people. And it was, it was extremely unhelpful. So we have got uh, letters, lawyers, letters going to the police union, and then that'll go up to the minister and we'll see what happens because we thought that was an extremely poor response by the commander on the ground on the day. And again, I, I wasn't there. I was, uh, my daughter Frey was there and uh, my hunch is he just thought uh, it's too risky to move these people on. These Christians can just suck it up and put up with a bit of noise. I hunch that's what he thought. And I hunch that's a deeply unhelpful thought to enact. Yeah, it's, it's a very unfortunate way of policing. Um, I, I will just mention to our audience, we do have a couple of Holocaust survivors uh, watching. So it's always good to see. Um, next up is Anne. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Hi, Mark. Um, so straight to my question. How many Christians uh, do you think know about the persecutions of Christians in the Middle East? And about Sharia law, uh, being forced to pay the jizya, and yeah. this is the key fundamental part, Muhammad. Because we can, like you say, that uh, Christians follow Jesus Christ. You, it's our teachings. 
it's in our practice. We try to emulate Christ to the best of our mm -hmm. ability. But when it comes to Muhammad, all right, yo, how many Muslims do you think know about uh, Muhammad's marriage to Aisha? Or the fact that he beheaded 900 Jews, I think in the life of Muhammad by Ibn Kashir. Because I've studied yeah. Muhammad through the Hadiths yeah. and stuff. So I'm familiar with the, what he do, did and what he yeah like 1,400 years ago. So my question is this. Like when it comes to comparing the two founders, Jesus Christ and Muhammad, how many Christians know about Muhammad? And yeah, my my experience is that very few Christians really know and very few Jewish people really know. And that is a problem because we're all naive. And so you take them at face value and you go, well, they're a religion of peace and they're all lovely and it'll all be great. And they're just like us. And um, and then when you try and talk about the, the anti-Semitism baked into uh, Islam right from its founding documents in the practice of Muhammad, as you rightly said, I mean, you, you, I mean, I've been called an Islamophobe and I've been called all kinds of things, Zio Nazi and full of hatred for, you know, racist. And, and I'm just going, well, no, I'm just looking off the text. Like I'm just reading the Quran to you at the moment, people, there's nothing Islamophobic here. I'm just trying to, um, so it's a problem. I'd say, uh, I'd say most Christians in the West are uh, blissfully, and we just, it's like someone who's it's it's like a woman with a lump in her breast who won't go and see the doctor because she's scared the prog the diagnosis might be bad so she ignores it or a bloke with prostate cancer and never goes to the doctor and you go no no just d denial denial work is a great coping strategy for a while but it generally <laughs> it has a it, it generally makes things worse and and in this instance you know like i mean there is a there is a jihad there is a genocide of african christians in nigeria and in the sahel going on right now there is an islamic insurgency in mozambique in northern mozambique so right next to south africa the south african defense force while they are taking while the south african government takes money to go and complain about um, israel's response to a jihadist terrorists in the form of Hamas, South African Defense Force are fighting a jihadist insurgents in their on their doorstep in northern Mozambique. They're massacring and slaughtering villages even as we speak. So uh, most people are not aware of this. It just feels too uncomfortable, too violent, and it's like, oh no, you know, it's it's just scaremongering. Um, it, it's 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 insane. It's just insane naivety and willful ignorance and blindness. And uh, it's not going to end well unless we address it. Uh, and it's it's just the truth, right? So if you care about your human being, fellow humans, and the, this is what, sorry, I'm just on a rave now. This perplexes me about the Christian community. I got people, it's not just the Jews. Like, come on, it's not, it's not, you know, this is a problem. The, the, the Middle East has been cleansed of Jews and Christians, um, and they continue to be, and it's it's happening everywhere. So we need to stand against it. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the head in the sand is a, attitude's a major problem. Well, we've just got time for one more quick comment. We've got Eddie Boaz, who's a Holocaust survivor who was actually at yeah. the Never Again Is Now rally. So, Eddie, would you like to say a word? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Mark. I thought the Sunday meeting at the domain was fantastic. Thank My you main beef is with the Jews that have turned on Israel. That's where my main with the likes of Norman um, Finkelstein and uh, Bernie Sanders and the likes. We've got and them I, here, Eddie. We've got plenty I, here. You don't have to go overseas to find no, them. No, I realise that. I realise that. Yeah. But we, we, Christians and Jews, we need to stop that. They don't realise what mm -hmm. happened in the Holocaust, they there were plenty of friendly Jews with the Nazis, both in Holland, where I was born, and in Germany. Yeah, they all went to the gas chambers in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know, Purim's coming up. It's the story of Esther, where Mordecai says to Esther, "Hey, you know, Esther, you've got to go talk to the king." And uh, sure, it might cost you your life, but don't think that if you hide in the palace, your life will be spared. Don't think that collaboration and appeasement will spare your life. You'll get it in the neck just like everyone else. And, uh, and you know, you've been put here for such a time as this. And if you choose not to go to the king and uh, advocate for your people, God will raise up, God will provide salvation from elsewhere, but you'll lose your life. And I, I think, Eddie, you are, 
you are exactly right. And it's the tragedy, you know, the glory and the garbage. You, you see people who are just captivated by fear and naivety and somehow think that if I criticize, I can get virtue signaling brownie points. I can be accepted by the elite. I can win the approval of my the people watching the Oscars, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, I can, uh, I don't understand it. I, I find it uh, naive and deeply, deeply sad, just deeply sad. Um, uh, and I, but, but on the other hand, like, like the beauty of our culture is we believe in free speech and you say, so the answer is persuasion and overcoming evil with good. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That's it, man. I, I, I've, I, it blows my mind. Well, Mark, that's all we're trying to do. Our community, your community, work together and bring more good and light into this world. And with that, I'd like to bring our session to a close. Mark, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I'd like to let everybody who's online know that they can support the Never Again Is Now journey. You can follow them on Instagram, Never Again, A-N-Z, or on Facebook, um, these rallies will be happening across the whole of Australia. We have supporters all over Australia. So wherever you are, if you're not in Sydney, which we've already had, but other supporters, please join the journey and join the movement because this is something incredible for our community. So we really encourage you to support. Mark, it's an incredible initiative and we're so privileged to have people like you standing up to evil. Thank uh, you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you all and God bless you all and God bless your work with AJA and uh you know thank you it's it's a, it's a it's a great privilege of my life to be doing this work. Mm. Thank you. And just to remind you that this has been recorded. The recording is available on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page. So we always encourage you to share this with your friends and family, get the message out there and support. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a wonderful evening.